Ephesians chapter 4, let's graduate a level tonight. It's good to be here, good to be with everybody. I'm glad you uh, brought the Word of God with you, ready to study, ready to learn. Galatians, Ephesians. Um, what was the last, just a quiz here. Are you ready for quizzes? Ready for quizzes? Jaden, you ready for a quiz? Too bad. What was the last epistle that the Apostle Paul wrote? Who knows? The last one. Okay, hang on, hang on. Anybody else? You know? You want to say Romans? Then say Romans. What do you want to say? Okay, what do you want to say? He wants to say Romans too. Yes, Liam. What do you think, Jaden? It's actually, it's actually, um, the clue is in the text. See if you can figure out where I'm reading from. Um, For now I am ready to be offered and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy. He was was in prison, and um, he knew that about any day they were going to come and off with his head uh, or kill him in some manner and uh, so he uh, was giving the last set of instructions to Timothy on how to be uh, he you know if you look in the beginning of chapter 4 I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ I preach the word be instant in season out of season reprove and on all of these things But watch thou in all things, verse 5, endure inflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry, for now I'm ready to to be offered. And then look at how he says it, I'm ready to be offered. He was giving himself a a martyr's sacrifice. Now, he wasn't dying for anybody's sins, and he wasn't paying a debt for any reason, but he was giving himself a martyr's sacrifice. And who would have inspired him? Stephen. Stephen would have been his inspiration for that because he's holding the coats of everybody. Saul, hold my coat. We're going to take care of this old boy. And so he's holding the coats and watching them throw big stones at Stephen's head to crush his skull. And he's seeing Stephen saying, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And he's got to like... So you can kind of see then at that point, he's either going to give in uh, or he's just going to go at it harder. So he decides apparently to go at it harder. I'm going to get all those Christians. They're not going to have any effect on me. He starts walking to Damascus and boom, God got him. So he understands He understands offering himself as a martyr. He knows what it'll do. It'll supercharge the rest of them. That's why you don't you don't want to kill your enemies. You're just gonna you're just going to make somebody a martyr, and they're they're just gonna they're gonna use it as a cause. Okay, everybody every group does it. Every group does it. 
And so anyway, that was, that was, I don't know why I asked that, but that was uh, Paul's last book that he wrote, okay? Uh, not sure if I know the first book, it could be Romans, uh, it, it could very well be, but we know uh, 2 Timothy was the last one, all right? And we also know that he wrote four to the Corinthians, two of them we have and two of them, apparently, God said uh, they don't matter because they probably he probably just reiterated things that, that he said in the first two. And uh, so we don't have copies of those. We just know from Paul saying it uh, to the Corinthians that he wrote a total of four letters to this one church going, would you straighten up? Would you quit doing this stupid stuff? And, and so anyway, and that's what he does in a lot of his letters to a church. Um, he did it to the Galatian churches. He said, who, you, you, uh, Galatians, who bewitched you? Oh, foolish Galatians. I mean, he calls them fools in there for letting somebody bewitch them into believing that they earn salvation by works. Uh, the only one that he doesn't do that with, and here's a, here'd be a, a, a way for you to redeem yourself. What one epistle does Paul write to a particular church where he doesn't really chew them out for anything. I'll give you a hint. It's not Romans. It's not Corinthians. It's not Galatians. It's not Ephesians. It's not Colossians. It's not Thessalonians. It's not Timothy. It's not Titus. It's not Philemon. It's not Hebrews. I've omitted one. Huh? I said Galatians. I said it's not Galatians. He didn't write to James. That James wrote James. It's the one I didn't mention. This that would have been the easiest. Yeah, John knows. He's probably up there. Replaying the tape. Nope. John didn't write. Paul didn't write to John. Philippians. I didn't say Philippians. Yeah. And, and he wrote rather nice things to them. All right. Huh? It is Philippians. Of course it is. That's, I just said so. Ephesians 4. Notice this. Everybody look. Take, uh, go, let's go to Romans. <clears throat> go to Romans. Uh, he doesn't say it in Romans, so go to 1 Corinthians, chapter 1. Yeah, he didn't say it there either. He's called to be an apostle. Uh, 2 Corinthians. Boy, help me out, Lord. Open my mouth and... He don't say it there either. He must... That must be... He, he says here, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord. And I was, I was looking at the books, the letters that Paul wrote, where he, where he says, I'm a prisoner. Uh, Paul and the Galatians, Paul an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ. Uh, he doesn't say it there either. Ephesians. Paul, an apostle by Jesus Christ, by the will of God. No. Uh, boy, who's he say it to? Paul, let's see, Philippians. Paul and Timotheus, no. Colossians. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, No. Where is he saying it at? And to Timothy? No? Huh. Boy, was I wrong about something. Paul acknowledges, I thought Paul acknowledged several times that he was a prisoner. Um, and maybe I'm just not seeing it, but here he's, he's notice he's saying, I therefore... The prisoner of the Lord. And just ponder that statement for a while. 
he's not saying the prisoner for the Lord. He's not, he's not talking about him being uh, imprisoned for preaching the gospel or teaching about Jesus Christ or anything like that. Oh, somebody's trying to write me in here. If I, yeah, Ephesians 3 says it, okay. Philemon, he says it, yeah, okay. I therefore the prisoner of the Lord. So in Philemon, what does he say there? A prisoner of Jesus Christ. And, and I always thought that meant he's for, no, a prisoner of Jesus Christ. A prisoner of the Lord. His, his imprisonment, you could, you could say the Lord captured him like, um, like uh, Obama says he captured Osama bin Laden. He says that. We don't know. Because we didn't, we didn't see it. We didn't see the body. We didn't see nothing. Yes? Me, his prisoner. See, that's, he says it that way. He never, he never says prisoner for. His, he says, I am his prisoner. Paul was on the war path to capture the body of Christ. That's what it boils down to. Jesus said, if they mess with you, they're messing with me. And so he's there. He's on his way to, to kill the body of Christ and to do away with it. And he gets captured on the way to um, uh, Damascus, Syria and... He is now the Lord's prisoner. He's going to stay that way for life. Nothing. He's, God's not, Jesus is not going to release him. He's not going to let him out on parole. Nothing like that. And you don't hear Paul complaining about it. In fact, uh, look, at, look at these first few verses of chapter 4. You'll see... How we are supposed to be. I therefore the prisoner of the Lord. Now, how does and measure measure this meekness up against? And I'm going to talk about the Catholic Church again. They are enemy number one with me as far as I'm concerned. Um. Bishops and priests and monsignors and cardinals and popes, they all love that men bow down to them and kiss their ring. They love that. That is a, a power rush that, a, that they, they do not live this humble, meek, servant life. All have been elevated by their church, by their teachings, by uh, the 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 uh, the carnival of what is the Catholic Church. I mean, they put on all these robes and all of these you know beautiful adornments, and on and on they dress themselves up, and they look all priestly, and they look holy. And they, they want everybody to see them as special people. And, and you get a lot of Catholics that buy into that. They buy into it. They, whatever, you know, oh, that's our priest and he's a holy man. And then what he says goes. They do what their priest tells them to do. And, you know, which is, oh, I don't want to get into all that. But anyway, that's what they do. And you don't see meekness and lowliness. You don't see that with them. And I'll, I'll tell you this too. I've been in some preaching situations, camp meetings and so on, where about as much of that was going on there 
as it was in the, as it is in the Catholic Church. It, 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 brother so and so and doctor so and so has done this. And, oh, nobody served the Lord like he has, and boy, nobody's lived a holier life than he has. And they elevate these people. And I did. I went to a meeting one time, and I swore I'd never go back, and I haven't. It it literally sickened me how they were speaking of one another up on the stage and and how lofty and elevated people were and I just I'm like I just don't go for that stuff I don't I don't fall for it I don't buy into it I know that uh, a, a minister um, pastor should be respected um, but that respect I believe gets earned um, you're, you're commanded uh, by by the scriptures um, you know, to pray for those who watch over your soul and, and to give heed to them. Um, nothing like, uh, I, think, um, I think John Paul II maybe was the first pope to stop writing in the big uh, throne that they have. The, usually a pope will will be brought in on a throne on a papal throne carried by four men just like the ark of the covenant and that's this that's the symbolism that they want you to see they want you to see that this man is elevated and lifted up above everybody else and i think john paul ii is the one who stopped doing that uh, francis didn't do it we know that um i'm surprised that benedict didn't do it um but anyway uh, that's how they used to bring popes in to a big service was he would be riding, sitting on this throne, carried by uh, two, four, five, six men. I think it was four. But anyway, they'd carry him in and, and he's elevated high above everybody else and he's blessing everybody and everybody's wanting to be there. And, and that just, that's sick. You don't, you don't see Paul doing that. In fact... We know that every place Paul went, he wouldn't even take any offering money from the church he was starting. He would set up shop as a tent maker. He made tents because that's what people lived in. And that's what he did. And he earned his money that way. Now that doesn't mean, and, and Paul's sure to bring this out, uh, that tithe money and tithes and offerings and so on are for uh the work of the pastor and the work of the ministry um you know mu do we muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn that careth god for oxen sometimes he may he may care more for oxen he does as preachers but that was the idea behind it but paul wouldn't take it because he said i don't want anybody to charge me with with the uh with the charge of doing this for taking everybody's money he wouldn't have that on him so here he is he says first of all i'm the prisoner of the lord and he says i beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called this vocation uh we use that word to describe um when we want it to sound more than just a job what, what job do you work i work at mcdonald's what's your vocation i work at mcdonald's you know you don't say that what you know what what are you doing what is your trade in life oh well i am a, uh you know i'm a heavy equipment operator or i'm a drywall taper or i am a carpenter or i am an automobile worker or i'm a mechanic or i'm a, an accountant or i'm a whatever Okay, that's a vocation. And we are all, every one of us, everybody listen. Thank you. All of us are called into the work of the Lord. All of us are. There is always something to be done. Always. And I will tell you, that no matter what church it is, 
I've seen it the same in just about every church I've ever been in, preached at, been a part of, or whatever. The majority of the work of the local church done by a minority of its people. That's just how it is. And I don't think that because I said something tonight that all of that's going to change now all of a sudden. Because I've been saying it now for 27, 20, yeah, 27 years, and it's never really changed. It's always a core that does most of what needs to be done. And um, so, but that doesn't mean that those who are, like, those who clean here or those who duplicate DVDs or those who do the music or those who... Uh, control the booth upstairs or whatever. That doesn't mean that there's all, that's all there is to do. Okay? I can tell you that I, when I get emails, messages, uh, phone calls from people who say, Pastor, we pray for you every single day. That is a work that I could not do without. I couldn't, I wouldn't make it. I, I would not make it doing what we're doing. The people that pray for me, the people that pray for this church and its continued success, the fact that we have had a target on us for years, but especially since 2009, We've had a target on us. When, when did we start the radio station? 2012. Man, has it been that long? Started the radio station. Now we just got a bigger target. Okay? Not a little bitty one. I mean, this is who, who can miss that one? And then uh, we get into Turkana a few years later. And then I start opening my mouth against those Catholic priests over there who I don't like. And uh, they don't like me either. And so that's why when I went to Turkana, I didn't go eat with them. They didn't invite me either. And, uh, and I wouldn't. I, I, I might would meet with them to tell them what they're doing wrong. But as far as anything else, I wouldn't do it. Um... But to, for, for people to pray for us, for people to support us uh, financially or support us with prayer or support us li like this. Everybody online, listen to this. One of, in fact, the number one big thing that has made us what we are is when people share what we do. Which is why I never copyrighted any of the videos. I've had people call and say, uh, Pastor, can we, can we get your permission to put your videos on DVD and give them... Oh my goodness, you don't need my permission? Do it! Do it! How come you ain't been doing it already? No, I don't say that. Um, uh, 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 Keith and uh, um, Pam first time I ever had any contact with them, they sent me a bunch of pictures. They set up a booth in, up there in, in, uh, for one of their Oktoberfest things, and they given out DVDs of mine. And I'm going, who are these people? Well, they were just doing it. Um, and so th that helps too, because it broadens the base of, of who watches. And... Um, so there's a, there's a vocation in being saved. You're praying for somebody. You're studying so that when the preacher preaches, you know what he's, you know what he's getting at. You're not learning something brand new. Or if the preacher goes bad and you hear it and you're like, oh, we need to pray for our pastor. He sounds like he's turning... Rick Warren on us or whatever. We need to pray for him that God will straighten him out. That is part of the vocation of what we do. 
There is, there is uh, spreading the gospel, sowing the seeds of the gospel. Uh, Paul said in, in 1 Corinthians, I, I have planted Apollos waters, but God's bringing the increase. There are some people who plant the seed really well. There are some pastors and some people who water it really well, which means they nurture it. They are nurturing type pastors. I don't really see myself as something like that. I'm more of a seed sower and, and so on. I, I let other people nurture it. But it all has to be part of the work. And he said, you walk worthy of that vocation. So it would be like uh, people getting off work from McDonald's with their McDonald's uniform on, going to Burger King right after work to get something decent to eat. Doesn't look good, does it? Okay. Or somebody with their Pepsi, Pepsi uniform on with a case of Coke. In fact, I think in, there was a time I think you could have, could have get fired for that. Uh, there's brand loyalty. If you work for a company, you've got to be loyal to that company. Okay. And um, I think that's probably why they let... I've heard this, that if you work uh, for a Bush Brewery down here, you can get free beer. As long as you're not drunk on the job, you get free beer. That's loyalty. That's, they're making sure that it's loyal. I wonder how the guys did with that beer with that queer on the front of it, with that guy that dressed like a woman. They quit drinking it. Yeah. Let's pour this out. Anyway, uh, I shouldn't talk about beer. But anyway, walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. You are called to be a Christian. You are called to be Christ-like. In everything you do, you're called to be like Jesus Christ. That's being worthy of the vocation. And I can't make you worthy. You can't make yourself worthy. Only Christ can do that in you. He has to change parts of you. He has to uh, work on issues in your life so that you are worthy of who he's called you to be. I mean, it's, it's the worst thing in the world when somebody who is a member of a church or part of a church or whatever gets caught up in some kind of adultery scandal or online scandal or anything like that. They are not walking worthy of that calling. They just simply are not. Your, and I, I've actually had to tell people this, which surprises me, but I've had to sit people down who were part of this church and say, what you're doing is wrong. And they would say, well, I mean, lots of people in the church do stuff wrong. Why is it that you're getting all over me? Well, you're on the board. I actually had to say that to somebody. You're on my board. Uh, that gets me a little bit of um, loyalty here. And what happened was this guy was on our board, but on Wednesday nights and who all knows what else, he was going to church someplace else. And I'm going, I think I have a right to say something here. And I, you would think I would never have to do that. But I've had to do it. If you're going to be a part of this church, there, are some, there is a way that we must live. And I'm all about forgiveness. I'm all about getting it worked out, and getting it under the blood, and, and forgiving people, and following the plan that Jesus set forth. Go to them privately. I'm all about that. But sometimes it has to reach a point to where I have to say, you know what? What you're doing is not right. I do have a right to say something. It's a responsibility I have. And you're either going to have to straighten up and do this or we'll have to take it before the church. And I never, I never want to do that. Never. Don't make me do that all right um, 
He says in verse 2, with all lowliness. The word lowliness has what root word in it? Low. Down here. Not up here. Not, I want to be on the stage so I can be seen. Not that. Lowliness. Meekness. Meekness does not mean weak. It means yielding what you believe you have a right to. Abraham showed meekness. When it came to that deal with Lot, their herdsmen strove together. Abraham could have said, Lot, get your guys, get off my property. If, you guys, if all you guys are going to do is fight me over water, well waters and, and grasslands and everything else, I'm the one that gave you what you got. You need to go find some other place to live. But that's not what Abraham did. He said, he said Lot, you take your pick of wherever you want. You, want. you want to go north, I'll go south. You want to go east, I'll go west. You get the first pick. Lot chose Sodom, lost everything. Abraham showed meekness, and God said, Now, Abraham, look northward, southward, eastward, and westward. All that then I see, I'm going to give it to you. Because Jesus said, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And it is a life lesson to learn how to be meek and not, I mean, we're Americans. We've got the spirit of 1776 in us that says we're going to fight for our rights. I took Lordson out shooting guns the other night. And boy, he was having a ball. Had my AR-15. And I said, now, Lordson, how would that be with 1.2 billion Indians that all had Second Amendment gun rights? He said, they'd kill each other in a week. And you know what? Our founding fathers knew that our Constitution was not written for all men. It was written for moral men. That's what he said. I think James Madison said that. He says, it's written for a moral people, a people who can govern themselves. But if you've got people who cannot govern yourself, and, and in India, their, their mindset, the way they think, the way they see the world, it goes back thousands of years and it goes back thousands of years of worshiping idols and doing horrible things to people in the name of those religions that they have, in the name of those 330 million fallen gods that they have. And that is the mindset of most people in India. And to give them American constitutional liberties wouldn't work it would not work those people need laws and lots of them anyway back to this meekness it takes a lifetime to learn true biblical meekness to learn to trust God that he'll bless he'll give if someone takes from you God will bless you back. And I've had people do it. I've had people, uh, one guy out in South Carolina selling my videos, and I, he does not have my permission to sell them. And I made that clear to him. But he continues to sell them, and I was going to sue him. And God kept, every time I think of it, God said, no, you're not. No, you're not. No, you're not. No, you're not. And so I never have. And you know what? What piddly amount of money I would have got out of him is nothing compared to the riches that God has blessed us with in the years to follow. I am glad that I did not pursue that. I'm glad I didn't. And uh, I'm just telling you, that meekness is not in our nature. It has to be worked on. You have to, and that's, that part of us that learns to trust God when we think something is going to be taken away from us, we trust God. 
I've had to learn the lesson over and over and over again. To trust God, trust God, trust God. And uh, I try to, but there's part of me that says, nope, I'm going to go get it myself. And maybe I shouldn't have done that. Maybe I shouldn't be that way. It says with long suffering, that, that word does mean long suffering. It means you, that you put up with people for a while. I was talking to a pastor one time. And he's, he was, we were talking about church discipline, like what I was talking about a while ago. And he said he had a guy in his church. He said, Mike, no kidding. Anytime he found out somebody in this church slipped up, he'd be running to me. Pastor, I think we need to do church discipline on so-and-so. And he meant having a trial. And... Uh, he said, I never did get through to that guy. That's not, how you, that's not how it's done, and that's not why it's done. But if it had been up to that guy, he probably would have ran off half of that church. Just waiting for them to mess up. Just waiting for them to slip up. Waiting for them to make a mistake. That's not long-suffering, and that's not forbearing one another in love. A good parent will discipline their children and when i say discipline i mean whoop them but they won't whoop them for every mistake they make that's not good parenting that's not all you're showing them is that they can never ever measure up to your standard and they'll never be good enough they'll never be good enough you show them love you show them kindness you show them uh forbearing and i tell you God will work wonders with that. I know about this. He says, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Two things that should always be first in our church. Unity of the Spirit and being bound together peacefully. Peacefully. No fights, no jealousy, no um, uh, gossiping, no backbiting, backstabbing. Uh, this is my right, this is my part, you do your part, I'll do mine. None of that stuff. Why do you think Jesus made us wash each other's nasty feet? Okay? All of that is the prime, like the prime directive for our church. Unity of the Spirit, which means that even if we don't agree on everything that we see in the Scripture, the Scripture always wins. And we subject ourselves to the whole of the Scripture, and we don't use it, as a sword to fight with or a rod to punish others with. It is a sword, it is a rod, and it has that use. But that use is limited and it has rules that guide it. So the unity of the Spirit is that all of us see ourselves as broken, wicked, hell-deserving sinners that have been saved by nothing but the grace of God. And there is, and this is what I tried to preach this morning. There's nothing that I do, nor any way that I live, that makes me see that I'm better than other people or other preachers. And I used to be bad about that. I did. Which is what caused that guy to have me up with his arm, his forearm up under my neck, hold me up against the wall with his fist drawn back. As I saw myself better than him. And uh, God let him do that. God let him do that. Yeah, Alicia, your dad, Courtney, your dad almost got punched right in the face, man. Right in the face. And I deserved it too. 
Uh, seven things here and then we'll close. There's one body. In fact, let me do this. There's one body. One body. Everybody here is part of this body. Okay? And there is no member that's less important than another member. None. And I like this little toe illustration. It is the farthest from my head that you can get. It's never seen by anybody. I don't go around showing my little toe to people. I just don't do that. But that little toe commands great strength. It is what keeps this body standing straight. And I never pay attention to it unless I'm talking about it like I am now. Now I'm flexing my little toes. Can you see it? Of course you can't. Okay? But I'm flexing them. And whenever my body starts giving a little side this way, that little toe pushes and pushes me back and keeps me where I need to be. But that little toe is not what's seen up on the stage. It's not what shows up on the videos. One of these days, I think I'll just do a, a, a show where I'm just talking with my toes, like this, in the camera. Be, be watching for it, okay? I think my wife will leave me then. But anyway, uh, it's one body. And, and every part of it is important. Every, that's why I don't like to lose people. And uh, I, know it's, I know it's just part of it, but it bothers me to lose people um, because that's, that's part of our body. And you're literally, it's like cutting off a finger or cutting off something. Now, if it's got enough cancer in it, it should be cut off because it'll infect the rest, of the rest of the body. That part I get. If your right hand is offending you, it must be cut off. Okay, and if you've got leprosy or cancer or something wrong in an infection or whatever, and, it can't, and it's going to infect the rest of the body and kill you, you've got to cut it off. I understand that. But you still don't want to do it. But there's one body and one spirit. And we all, this, this is what we believe. This is the spirit right here. So all of us are in agreement. This is the word of God. There's nothing else here. So I think we're good on that. Even as you are called in one hope of your calling. So there's one gospel, one hope, and then one Lord, not two. I'm not the replacement for the Lord. I'm not the Pope of Bethel. Okay? It's one Lord. He's the one that makes the decisions. There's one faith, which we all believe. One Baptism, uh, which we're going to do, water baptism. But he's also, he, I think more importantly, he's talking about spirit baptism. And there is one baptism. When you are saved, you are baptized by and in the Holy Spirit. It does not happen months later. It does not happen when they, somebody lays their hand on you. It happens when you are saved. And you cannot be saved without it. And then... One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. So that this goes along with the seven spirits of God. If there's seven things here, then that's of God. There would be seven spirits of God. That's Isaiah 11. And that would also be part of it uh, with us. And seven is a number for what? Perfection and completion. And it's done. So... Is there anything that needs to be added to this list? Nope. One body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. And that right there, I mean, if you, to, if you wanted to just belt a Mormon with a verse of Scripture, say, um, so, let's say that uh, you're right, that our God, Jehovah, grew up on a planet like we're growing up now and 
He, what, did he have a God over him? Who was that God? Because right here it says there's one God and one Father. So how could our God grow up on a planet like us people? Because that's what they believe. As God is, man will be, and as man is, God once was. That's their saying. And they believe God grew up as a man on a planet. My question is, who was his God? And why does there so much in the Bible that rips to shreds the idea of any other God? But according to Mormonism, there must be billions of them. Billions of gods. All of gods over their own planet. I just, I just don't get it. I think those people are not thinking right. Amen? They don't have the same spirit we have. Say, they don't have the same baptism. They don't have the same faith. They don't have the same Lord. So, and, and think about this. If they don't have the same stuff that we've got, we can't fellowship with them. Can't fellowship with Roman Catholics. Can't fellowship with Jehovah's Witness. Can't fellowship with Mormons. Can't fellowship with about half of what's going on right now because it's a different God. Amen. Let's stand up.